The Future History of Energy and Transportation Documenting the paradigm shift from the era of oil and internal combustion, to the era of robotics By Julian Cox Narrated by the author with the aid of an artificial intelligence Chapter 9 Component Level Energy Efficiency Explored The reason why it is possible to exchange energy currencies at all, and the reason why exchange rates are frequently abysmal is because the physical world has one currency for energy and it is none of them that are usually discussed in polite society nor experienced in everyday life, at least not at our current state of technology. That is nuclear energy, not the invariably radioactive kind, just the ordinary matter-of-fact kind in proportion to E equals mc squared. This is not something that needs to be hidden behind incomprehensible jargon. All this means is that tiny amounts of mass interrelate with vast amounts of energy and vice versa. This is important when the value we seek is energy, like electricity or heat, and not matter for its own sake, such as a large bulk of fuel. One way to make practical sense of this is to consider the mass, mass is commonly experienced as weight, attributable to energy itself. Such that if one were to put energy into an object in any form such as heat, velocity or an electrical charge it can be said to accumulate relativistic mass. It can be an extremely tiny amount of extra mass, usually nothing that would add noticeable weight on a kitchen scale, but that little bit of extra mass is just as real as the mass of anything ordinary. Any surplus mass comes packaged with a phenomenal desire to come to rest with its surroundings, such that it will dissipate by any and all available avenues. Not just the method by which energy was introduced. Concentrations of heat for example, dissipate not just on contact with colder surroundings but by glowing in infrared more than the background. Naturally, objects don't carry on losing heat until reaching absolute zero, they come into equilibrium with everything nearby. There are many very strange interactions of energy and materials in nature, some more useful than others such as squashing a piezoelectric material with mechanical energy, to produce electricity. This is useful for cigarette lighters and airbag collision sensors, it is also the mechanism by which the human nervous system gets a sharp electrical signal to quit stressing bones, or chewing hard objects before bones and teeth break. One of the better ways of seeking energy efficiency is to try to the maximum extent possible, to get things done without energy conversions at all. With this in mind, what would we look for at the component level in an energy efficient drivetrain? Here, it is simply the case that heat engines such as the internal combustion engine are out of the question, when seeking to optimize the efficiency of a mechanism to convert energy to mechanical motion. There are other reasons to consider fuels favorably, unrelated to component level energy efficiency, specifically that they are a pre-packaged store of potential energy in air that can be moved from the ground to the place in which useful work is required, and so long as we supply the energy to do that, then we don't have to push the actual car. With cars we are mainly interested in kinetic energy, relating to motion. When seeking kinetic energy, at first glance, an endeavor to avoid energy conversion steps seems to call for a store of mechanical energy, in conjunction with a kinetic energy charger. For example a clockwork car and a wind turbine with a winding mechanism to rewind the spring. Perhaps with the addition of a closed-loop water tower to store energy in between charging cars and for windless days. Better still with something that tops up the tower with rainwater. Compressing the like poles of permanent magnets would make for an interesting sort of spring-like kinetic energy store, because here we are interacting with a massless field effect. Hundreds of magnetic disks arranged in tubes, positive negative negative positive positive negative, and so on in a large array of such tubes, would certainly permit for a long throw spring, capable of driving a hydraulic ram to turn four wheels via hydraulic drive motors. Regenerative deceleration would be an inherent feature of such a system, too. Recompressing a magnetic spring could be accomplished extremely rapidly, either by applying very large amounts of mechanical force via an external hydraulic ram, to return the onboard spring to its fully charged position, or to briefly introduce a large amount of electrical power through an arrangement of induction coils to temporarily overwhelm the magnetic field of the onboard magnets. A possibility for a machine of this nature is that it could be charged by a team of oxen, or in extremis by a group of villagers pulling a rope through an arrangement of block and tackle, thus achieving complete independence of mobility from infrastructure. Another fascinating possibility is that such a device could conceivably be charged by thermal hydraulic expansion, taking advantage of the temperature differential between day and night. 
simply a hydraulic ram attached to a sealed coil of hydraulic oil that retreats at night and protrudes with enormous force in the sun. Rather like a big version of devices used to automatically lift the windows of glass houses. Better yet, to simply attach the coil directly to the hydraulic drive of the vehicle and drive the spring back with that. Assuming the specific energy density and volumetric energy density of magnetic springs checks out, this is the sort of thing that could drive the output of a village to market even if the village had just one such vehicle and nothing else by way of modern amenities. One of the greatest discoveries of all time is the potentially lossless, given superconducting wires, relationship between electricity and magnetism. A well-designed modern DC brushless or AC induction electric motor, harnesses that affect with very high real-world efficiency, using relatively inexpensive materials. At ordinary temperatures and pressures an electric motor can achieve around 92% efficiency at the component level, at a steady and optimum RPM and torque, and not far short of this number across a widely varying speed and torque regimen, as a function of sophisticated electronic controls. This is outstanding component level energy efficiency. The electric motor is a device that leverages massless field effects to convert electrical power to mechanical power, electrical energy to kinetic energy. Some waste heat is developed due to the imperfect electrical conductivity of ordinary non-superconducting motor coils, as well as some waste heat due to bearing friction. While consequently some air or fluid pressure is normally used for cooling, the very lossy effects of heat and pressure that are central to the function of an engine, play no integral role in either delivering or regenerating power in an electric motor. Accordingly, as a standalone technology an electric motor is by definition within spitting distance of absolute perfection. 100% conversion efficiency being out of the question for any system. While there is interesting scope for improvement in drive inverters, maybe before the end of time something will be found to do the job of an electric motor 7% better than it does today, that would take it to 99% efficiency. It is therefore very safe to say that electric motors are great. Not only that but they are the greatest way we ever need to encounter to use energy to move ground vehicles, so long as we can do a good job of getting electricity to where the motor is. Electric bullet trains with panographs are a fine example. With modern electric vehicles and software-controlled drive inverters, the result is so good and so efficient that it has effectively moved the problem downstream to electrical charge storage and delivery. Here the optimum massless energy step would appear to be electrostatic charge. This is the effect that causes a party balloon to make hair stand up or to produce a carpet spark, the same effect that drives thunder and lightning. Devices such as supercapacitors or ultracapacitors are much better than party balloons and plastic-soled shoes. The idea here is like charging up the anode of a battery without any chemical interactions with the cathode, making charging and discharging almost lossless. The accumulation and release of electrons without chemical reactions means that there is negligible performance erosion over repeated cycles, attributable to the buildup of the products of unwanted side reactions. Ongoing efforts are in play to store sufficient static electricity in this manner to become a practical means of driving vehicles. At present energy density and cost per kilowatt hour attained by batteries with acceptable power density, acceptable round-trip efficiency and cycle life is far superior to supercapacitors and ultracapacitors. Within the bounds of known physical effects, the ultimate potential for driving cars comes from eliminating the weight not just of the fuel, by replacing it with electricity, but also eliminating almost all of the mass required to store energy on board a vehicle, too. This speaks to the desirability of converting some tiny amount of mass directly to energy in a nuclear reaction on board the vehicle, so essentially a nuclear-powered car. Despite the existence of nuclear batteries, both thermal and beta-voltaic, thus far we have not validated a mechanism to do this effectively, safely or at low cost, nor in an appropriate power band on a suitable scale. Meanwhile we have batteries. There are unwanted conversion inefficiencies in shuttling a reversible redox reaction backwards and forwards in a battery, just like the heat lost from compressing and decompressing a spring. There is erosion of the chemical mechanism over repeated cycles, due to the partial breakdown of electrolytes and the buildup of the products of unwanted side reactions. This erosion is analogous to metal fatigue in a metal coil spring. These unwanted effects are amenable to incremental improvements in the choice and arrangement of materials, again like the choice of materials from which to make springs. These deleterious effects are limited in extent and are trivial compared with burning the entire chemistry for heat and pressure in a piston engine, 
or for that matter oxidizing the entire chemistry for electricity and exhausting it from a fuel cell. Batteries of circa 300 watt hours per kilogram are presently in mass production and 1200 watt hours per kilogram batteries already exist in the lab. There are no mysteries involved on the path to batteries four times more capable than the batteries now driving high performance sedans 315 miles EPA on a single charge. This is the normal progress of technological development and the result will be electric vehicles that are amply capable of outperforming gasoline and diesel engines in every setting. A useful feature of electrical systems is innate compatibility with software-driven robotic controls and simplicity of complete drive system interrogation. No matter the technology path taken, component-level energy efficiency is referring to the opportunity cost of a process taking place within the vehicle, as measured on the bench. There is no output of passenger miles at the component level, instead it is expressed as a percentage of the energy output versus input. Possible inputs are electricity or the thermal energy potential of a fuel, or in the more abstract examples, the kinetic energy applied to a spring or the nuclear energy ultimately available from a radioactive, fissile or fusion material. No matter how energy is introduced to a complete vehicle drive train, whether it is electricity or gasoline or some other fuel, that energy will ultimately be dissipated to a resting state with its surroundings, some as heat, some as light or other electromagnetic radiation, some mechanically such as sound and vibration, some as self-discharge in the case of a battery, some as evaporation and incomplete combustion in the case of liquid fuels. The remainder in the desired shaft output. Most importantly, what we are not doing here is to allow for bifurcating frames of reference for component-level energy efficiency to encompass assumptions, on any basis relating to how the energy came to be supplied to the component, the particular drivetrain technology. Instead to disambiguate this topic from a discussion of vehicle efficiency, materials usage, emissions or any other consideration, 